The Lord be with you. Let us stand and pray. O gracious Father, we humbly beseech thee for thy holy Catholic Church, that thou wouldest be pleased to fill it with all truth and all peace. Where it is corrupt, purify it. Where it is in error, direct it. Where in anything it is amiss, reform it. Where it is right, establish it. Where it is in want, provide for it. Where it is divided, reunite it. For the sake of him who died and rose again and ever liveth to make intercession for us, Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Have a seat. That prayer is the prayer for the church, which is on page 37 of your BCPs. It's just, it's a beautiful prayer for the church. We'll unpack parts of it, but not, not all of it. One of the things I think is worth uh, appreciating in it is that it acknowledges the possibility of corruption, error, and going amiss in the church, and so the need always for purification, redirection, and reform. What we'll, what we'll talk about in a little bit is this, this line where it is divided, reunited, and we'll talk about in what sense we can say that the church is divided, because it obviously is, but in another sense, how we can, event, we can say that the church is, in fact, not, you know, not divided, but rather, ultimately, in an ultimate sense, it already is united. So we'll talk more about that in a little bit. So just a reminder of where we've been and where we're going. We introduced the course through our opening colic for purity, Almighty God, unto whom all hearts are open, etc. Last time we talked about the Bible and the Book of Common Prayer using the uh, language of <clears throat> the summary of the law as our reference point in the liturgy. Today we're talking about the church and authority and this language of with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven. And as a reminder, kind of the bigger structure here is taking us through the Eucharistic liturgy from our opening, Collect for Purity, through the liturgy of the word, <clears throat> and then into the liturgy of the sacraments. This is at the proper preface, therefore with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then uh, it moves into the, the, the Eucharistic liturgy proper, the Eucharistic canon. So that's where we are. Last time we talked in particular about the Bible and the BCP, and we said that the Bible was the final source of authority for Christians. The Bible was, is the divinely inspired final authority for Christians. But the Bible is also authoritatively interpreted by the creeds and councils of the undivided church. So what that means is just that if, if Christian A and Christian B both agree that the Bible is the divinely inspired authority, but they disagree about what the Bible says, where do we go to resolve that, that difference? And in some traditions, you just, all you have is each individual Christian as their individual Pope, and so it's them, the Bible, and ideally the Holy Spirit, and there's no, so there's no recourse outside of the individual's interpretation. That's a problem, and so most, uh, that, most churches, including most Protestant churches, say there has to be some form of authority outside of the individual's interpretation. And, and my argument, and I think it's faithful to the Anglican tradition, I think it's faithful to the Catholic tradition, broadly understood, is that the Bible is authoritatively interpreted by the creeds, especially the Nicene Creed, and by the councils of the undivided church. That's where the church spoke with a unified, unified voice in ecumenical council and, said, and, and taught us, had a teaching office in teaching us what, what the scriptures say. And as Anglicans, our, our understanding of scripture is expressed in our liturgies, uh, supremely in the Book of Common Prayer. So that's what we talked about last week. Any questions thus far? Implied in this is what, what you might call an implied ecclesiology. Ecclesiology is just study of the church. So in this, what I've just said, I've already implied what we believe, some things that we believe about the church, namely that it actually has the authority to interpret and teach scripture. Does that make sense? Other, other bodies wouldn't necessarily always hold to the church's teaching authority in the same way. And so the question that that then <clears throat> leads to is fundamentally, what is the church actually? And so we're going to say, as, take as our basic premise, that the church is the mystical body of Christ, and we are members of that body as Christians. 
the, the New Testament has all sorts of images and language for what the church is. Jesus actually doesn't use that la the language of the church or really even the body of Christ, although he, he implies it constantly in different places. He talks about the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God, uh, which is not exactly synonymous with the language of church, but it is, it is very close to it. And, and the church itself, we would say, comes into existence at the end of Jesus's life. There's a couple different places people point to as when does the church come into full its, its actual existence. You could say it comes into existence at the Last Supper. You could say it comes into existence when, when, when Jesus breathes on them in John 21 and he says, receive ye the Holy Ghost. Uh, the other place that's most commonly pointed to is at Pentecost, when the Holy Ghost descends on the apostles who are gathered there and, and the tongues of fire appear and they would say, okay, so that's the start of the church. I, I think all of those are correct. Uh, none of them is, is incorrect. And the other thing to remember is that the church is in some sense grafted into or, or part of or a continuation of the story of Israel in the Old Testament. So it's worth remembering that the church is in, in St. Paul's language in Romans 9 through 11, it's grafted into Israel. It's complicated. But I do think the governing metaphor, the main, and it's not really even a metaphor, I would say, the governing image, the main one in the New Testament in St. Paul's epistles is as the body of Christ. And that has become the most important identifier. There's others. St. Paul says you are God's building. So the church is a building in some sense. Uh, it, it, we, the church is also the bride of Christ, St. Paul says. And all that stuff is interesting and complicated. But the body of Christ is the fundamental, meta, fundamental image. And I say it's not really a metaphor because in various places, St. Paul doesn't treat it very metaphorically. I think most infamously in 1 Corinthians 6, he advises the Corinthians that they should not sleep with prostitutes. Apparently the Corinthians needed to be told that. Uh, <laughs> they were doing a lot of crazy things. And he says the reason you shouldn't sleep with prostitutes is because you are members of the body of Christ. And by members, he doesn't mean like you're members of the Elks Club or members of an organization. He means body parts. Like my finger is a member of my body, you are a member of the body of Christ. And so he says, when you sleep with prostitutes, you are uniting the body of Christ to prostitution. And so the argument against prostitution is not some sort of, well, that's bad, that's morally bad, don't do that. I mean, he does think that, but that's, his actual argument is, that, is, is around this organic vision of the body of Christ, that you're taking the body parts of Jesus, which in some sense you mystically are, and you're uniting them to prostitution, and you shouldn't do that. And, it's, and there's a very similar argument for St. Paul for all forms of sort of bodily immorality, is that you are, in fact, part of this mystical body of Christ. And so what you do either, either honors or defaces the body of Christ. So it's important to understand that we as members then are sort of parts of that body in some strange, odd, and crazy sense. So what we're going to do right now is we're going to look at the solemn declaration of the Anglican province of America. So I've got some handouts here, which is the kind of preamble uh, to the constitution and canons of the Anglican province of America. This is the um, Anglican equivalent to the preamble to the constitution, we the people of the United States in order to form a more perfect union, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this is setting forth what the APA is and what, what the APA believes. So of course it starts with an invocation of the Trinity and then, it, and then it says, who is speaking? We the bishops, so it's primarily a statement by the bishops, but they're doing it together with the deputies from the clergy and the laity of the Anglican province of America. So one thing you see is that the, bi the bishops in our, in our polity, in our organization, our understanding of the church, the bishops take the lead, but they do so in concert with the clergy and the people. And then they say, th this actually, this first part of the second paragraph is a little bit confusing. I think it's missing a comma, actually, to be honest with you. We declare this church to be and desire that it shall continue in full communion with all Anglican, all traditional Anglicans throughout the world. So we're, they're saying that we're in, 
in communion with all traditional Anglicans throughout the world, and we declare it as an integral portion of the one body of Christ composed of churches which united under the one divine head and in fellowship with the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We'll come back to that. The part I want to underline right now or, or highlight right now is that they declare the church to be an integral portion of the one body of Christ. What does that tell you about how the APA understands itself? To say that you're an integral portion of the one body of Christ, what do you, what do you think that means? Yeah, we're not the whole church. There you go, that's sort of the main takeaway. The, uh, the APA does not declare that we are the one true body of Christ and anybody not in the APA is outside the church. There's no claim in the APA solemn declaration to be the one true church. And one of the things that I would actually say about, and so therefore it is a church versus the church. It is not the church. It is an integral portion of the one body of Christ. One of the things I would say is that, and we'll, we'll talk more about this in a little bit, but I, I think Anglicans are inherently freed from what I call one true churchism. That is the tendency to think that you have it down and nobody else has it at all is almost impossible for Anglicans. I mean, Anglicans act, will believe it, but it doesn't, it's incoherent within the Anglican tradition. It's not possible for Anglicans, for a variety of reasons, to, to conceive of themselves as the only true church. Yeah, so there's a, there's, the, the Anglican Church does not have the same exclusivity, not only of the Roman Catholics, but also of the Eastern Orthodox. And for that matter, in a sort of different way, certain Protestant bodies end up in the same, doing the same thing in a, in a, in, in a more unhistorical way. So certain branches of, of you know, Baptists, the Baptist tradition would basically see all non-Baptists as, as damned and, and not, not the true church, right? Anglicans, for a variety of reasons, can't really, we can't really do that. Um, and, and I actually, and I consider that to be ultimately a blessing because we couldn't even take ourselves seriously if we were to claim that no other church is, is pure. We're the only pure ones for, for a variety of historical reasons. It's just not a plausible thing for Anglicans to claim. And we'll get into some of that. And I, and I think that's a helpful, um, helpful reminder for, for the rest of the church. And to me, it's also, it also, it relieves a certain burden for, for, I think, for Roman Catholics and for Eastern Orthodox, uh, the Eastern Orthodox churches in particular, but also for Baptists. They have to remake, they have to, certain parts of their history that don't quite fit particularly well, they have to re-narrate to fit. Does that make sense? So the East, I mean, one way this shows up is the East has to essentially, uh, they're out of communion with Rome, and so Rome is somehow not fully the church, and yet they acknowledge that the Bishop of Rome is the successor of Peter, ultimately, and so how can you deny that they're sort of valid? And in the same way that the Roman Catholic Church would see the East as, as in rebellion against the one true church, even though the Eastern Orthodox Church has the majority of the successors of the apostles, and so they, they have to kind of, um, and both of them have to pretend that they've, they've, they are the one true trajectory of the church, and the church from, you know, 1 BC to, or sorry, 1 BC, 1 AD, 33 AD, to the present is just, it's just Roman Catholic all the way down, or it's Eastern Orthodox all the way down. Anglicans can't pretend that Jesus Christ instituted the Anglican church, because Anglican means English, and English, and the English people did not exist as such around the, at the time of Christ. So you can't imagine that Jesus Christ instituted the Anglican church, and everybody else is sort of like in rebellion against Anglicanism. Does that make sense? Likewise, Baptists actually sort of end up doing the same, same thing sort of amusingly, like the apostles were all Baptists, and then everybody just forgot about that for about 1,800 years and lost track of things, and then rediscovered being Baptists. And honestly, to some extent, so Lutherans, Presbyterians, you know, end up, Cal Calvin is out there assuming that the apostles were Calvinists, and that just got lost in the mix somewhere, and now he's rediscovering the true Calvinist nature that it was always there. Now, I do think the Anglican Church, or at least uh, certain parts of the Anglican Church, rightly interpret the New Testament better than, than other traditions. Otherwise, I, I wouldn't be an Anglican. But not in such a way that, that we have an exclusive claim to the apostolic tradition, because we don't. 
So, so Augustine, of, so there's, there's a couple different ways that you can root the, his, the history of the church in England, but the, the main line would be, or the, the, the one that we would root back through would be Augustine of Canterbury, who was, who was a, a bishop in the fifth century, who, who Pope Gregory consecrated a bishop and sent off to make contact again with the English church. And so the English bishop's line goes through Augustine of Canterbury. And then Gregory, through that, Eventually you get to St. Peter, St. James, and again, one other apostle whose name is in our narthex on Bishop Grundorf's <laughs> list of, uh, so there's three apostles that the mainstream of the Anglican tradition could root them, would root themselves back through, toward two. And, and yeah, now that, again, that's not, it's not, we are, Anglicans are not the only ones who are not exclusive, because it, they would, now I'm, it almost sounds like I'm claiming that we are exclusively the only people who are not exclusive. But, but, I, but I do think, in particular, the, the Roman Catholic and the Eastern Orthodox self-understandings requires a kind of exclusivism that I don't find historically or theologically ultimately plausible. And so they have to sort of, uh, they, they're, they get dis, they're, there's a discomfort with the messiness of their own history. Does that make sense? Anglicans can be comfortable with the messiness of their own history because they're not claiming to be the sort of infallible soul carrier of the tradition. Yeah, and, 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 and we would not see someone going from a Roman Catholic diocese into an Anglican diocese as a conversion per se, you would be changing your jurisdiction. And, and the theology, it's not like you'd, there would be changes in theology, but I don't think we would ever say you've, con you might say you became Anglican, but you wouldn't say you converted to Anglicanism because that would suggest that you have rejected one religion and joined another. And that's not the Anglican understanding of what happens. You've, you've changed your jurisdictions and, and we're not in communion with Rome so that, that it, there's, the, there's, a, there's a much bigger shift than when coming from the REC to the APA, we're in communion with each other, and so it's a much easier shift. But we, would, we, would, we wouldn't see it as a conversion, per se. So, we're an integral portion of the one body of Christ, but we are not claiming to be the only uh, body of Christ. So we're composed of churches. The one body of Christ is composed of churches which united under the one divine head, and in fellowship of the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, hold the one faith, revealed in holy writ. Holy writ is just a fancy word for talking about the Bible. And defined in the creeds as maintained by the undivided primitive church in the undisputed ecumenical councils. So this is the, the when I, my, what I said previously about, we, we see the Bible as, as the authoritative, source of doctrine, but that it is authoritatively interpreted by the creeds and councils of the undivided church. That's not me making, making stuff up on my own. That's what our province teaches. So the church holds to the one faith that's revealed in scripture that is interpreted authoritatively by creeds and by the councils. So going back to that first or the middle paragraph there. So we receive the same canonical scriptures of the Old and New Testament as containing all things necessary to salvation. That's taught in our uh, catechism, and in the 39 articles, teach the same word of God, partake of the same divinely ordained sacraments through the ministry of the same apostolic orders, and worship one God and Father through the same Lord Jesus Christ by the same Holy and Divine Spirit who is given to them that believe to guide them into all truth. The same there, you see same, 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 same. That's referring to the same things that the undivided primitive church taught. So we receive the same scriptures as the undivided primitive church, that is the first thousand years church. We teach the same gospel, the same word of God. We partake of the same sacraments as the undivided church. That's the claim. Does that make sense? So we're, we are rooting ourselves in this, in the undivided church of the first thousand years before East and West split in the Great Schism. So you see, cre you see scripture creeds councils, and then you see sacraments and orders and holy orders. And so what I'm going to argue and claim is that, that, the whole, that the holy Catholic church is a church that maintains the scriptures, the creeds, and the councils, and that celebrates the sacraments and has valid holy orders. And if you have those five things, I've said this a couple times, then, then what you have is a Catholic church. And if you don't have those things, then what you have is not a Catholic church. And we'll talk about what that means in a bit. So this first paragraph, or the first big paragraph, the middle paragraph technically, explains 
basically explains how we, the APA, are a Catholic church. This is the claim that we hold to the Catholic faith. The next paragraph, the last paragraph, explains what makes us distinctly Anglican. So we're determined by the help of God to both ma hold and maintain the doctrine and sacraments and discipline of Christ as the Lord hath commanded in his holy word, and as the traditional Anglican movement hath received and set forth. So the claim here is that the traditional Anglican movement is faithful to the Catholic church, to the Catholic faith. And again, and again we'd be using that more broadly than we, when, we, when we say Catholic, we don't necessarily mean Roman Catholic. We see the Roman Catholic church as a Catholic church as well, but not the only Catholic church. So, and then the traditional Anglican movement hath received and set forth the, the same in, and then everything from the Book of Common Prayer all the way to 1801 is actually just the technical full title of the 1928 Book of Common Prayer. So all of that is actually just the title of the book, which is a long title. So the title of the BCP, the full title, is the Book of Common Prayer and Administration of the Sacraments and Other Rites and Ceremonies of the Church, together with the Psalter or Psalms of David, pointed as they are to be sung or said in churches, and the form and manner of making, ordaining, and consecrating of bishops, priests, and deacons, and in the 39 Articles of Religion of 1801. So that's essentially, the, this, that, that describes, anyway, this book, which has all of those in it. Does that make sense? So, we hold to the Catholic faith that we say is contained in this book. This book is a, not, not contained in the sense that, that this is the only true container of the Catholic faith, but rather this is, this is a faithful expression of the Catholic faith, is the Book of Common Prayer. And in the spirit of the affirmation of St. Louis of 1977, and to transmit the same unimpaired to our posterity. So the affirmation of St. Louis is, is similar to what we've stated before, but it clarifies a few things. One, it clarifies that, we're holding to, that we hold to the seven ecumenical councils. I think I mentioned before that there's arguments among Anglicans about whether we hold to the four ecumenical councils or the full seven ecumenical councils of the undivided church. The affirmation of St. Louis clarifies that we hold to seven ecumenical councils, and it, and it explicitly states that, at, like the Roman Catholic Church teaches, that male-only ordination is, is a doctrine that can't change, that that's a given that we receive and perpetuate. So that's, and there's obviously a lot more to the affirmation of St. Louis, and, and it's worth reading, but that's, that's what it means. Yeah, that, and that's why you, that's why the, the, we were called the continuum, or the continuing Anglican movement, because it's, I mean, that's a polemical claim, right? We are the continuing Anglicans, and they're the leave, departing Anglicans would be, yeah, the claim. The yeah, yeah and that's, that's, that's certainly what is being, being claimed and implied. Sure. Yeah, so the Anglican, so we're, a, we're the church because we are a Catholic church because we have scripture, creeds, councils, sacraments, and holy orders, and we are in the Anglican tradition. We're an Anglican church because of our, uh, our, our prayer book tradition and the particular kind of Anglicans that we are is sort of stated in the affirmation of St. Louis. So that just identifies that we're Anglican and, 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 and how so. So two words that recur in this solemn declaration, there's the same, 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 which I already mentioned. It's what they're saying is that we believe the same scriptures and practice the same sacraments as the undivided church. And then the other word that recurs a lot in that second paragraph is one, right? We said an integral portion of the one body of Christ composed of churches which united under the one divine head and in fellowship of the one holy Catholic and apostolic church hold the one faith revealed in holy writ. You see that one, 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 one. So there's this emphasis on unity in the Anglican, in, in, our, in, our, in the founding documents of the Anglican province of America. Now, there's many reasons that people would think, would make fun of us for that or say, what are you kidding? You, you keep saying one, but you're not unified at all. And one of the reasons that they could talk about this is that the APA itself is originally, so our diocese, the Diocese of the Eastern United States, goes back to the 1960s and has continued since then uninterrupted, but the APA itself is actually born in the 1990s as a result of intra-Anglican squabbles that are not worth repeating because they don't rise to the level of serious theology, they just are interpersonal problems and other sort of scandals that are just 
embarrassing, basically. Like, there's, not, there's not, nothing good to be said about them. So the APA itself is sort of like born out of chaos and, and the splintering of, of the Anglican movement in a lot of ways. So how, so, so some of, some of our, so even some of our like people that we're in communion with now, like the ACC and the ACA would sort of be like, how can you claim that to be all about one, 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 one when you're coming out of this chaotic splintering? Does that make sense? Great question. In communion, yeah. So in communion uh, is determined in our polity by being in communion with another body is determined in our polity by our bishop and their bishop agreeing on uh, that, that we share fundamentally the same unity. But what it actually means, technically on the ground, is that we are fully comfortable with our people taking communion in their churches. We already like unofficially on the ground, like if somebody was moving from Bishop Haverland's church in Georgia down to Orlando, Florida, there would be unofficial like, oh, go to the APA parish, you know, because, because they, we knew that that's where you're gonna, you're gonna have solid theological similarities. But you couldn't officially say that because our bishops weren't in communion. Likewise, um, it, it has to do with how, how priests are. So we recognize the ACC's orders as valid. And so somebody who's in the ACC can come into our church and serve and, and vice versa. Okay, so there can be, I would say between the ACC and us, for instance, the disagreements are, are pretty minor. Well, they're minor and they're not minor. They have to do with, they have, they have a lot longer, their canons, which are their laws essentially, are a lot bigger than ours. I think ours are about 25 pages and theirs are 200 pages of canons. Yeah, they have a different, their canons are based on a different common law theory, basically. It's hard to explain, but so they end up being a lot longer. And the way that they structure, I don't, and, and because their canons are 200 pages long, I have not read them. <laughs> um, but my understanding is that the, the, the structure of authority between a bishop and, a, and the rector is different than it is in ours. But that's not fundamentally everything I've said about the, like this, the book I'm primarily pulling from, not, not solely, but primarily is Archbishop Haverland's Anglican Catholic Faith and Practice. He's the ACC um, Archbishop. So, okay, so some of our fellow Anglicans would, would sort of laugh at our idea that, that of this, like, one faith, one, 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 because they would say, well, you know, you're in this body that broke off from other Anglican bodies. And the Episcopal Church would certainly think, you're talking about unity. Well, you went into schism. You left us, they would say. Um, and that's always sort of a funny, Episcopal, Episcopalians love to, well, I don't know, certain, certain Episcopalians love to refer to us as schismatics. You know, we broke off, we're schismatics. Uh, which is always sort of like a little bit ironic because the Roman Catholics are like, wait a minute, you're the schismatics, you left the Roman Catholic Church, right? And the Eastern Orthodox would be like, no, no, you're the schismatics because you left the, the, the Eastern Orthodox faith, you know? And then the Roman Catholics would be like, no, 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 you left the Roman Catholic faith. So everybody, you know, will have these kind of squabbles. But, but the idea that, that, that we're, we keep saying one, 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 well, how can we possibly claim that given the insane history of division that I've just narrated to you? What were you going to say, Chuck? Well, I got into schism over heresy. Well, right. So then, so then, yeah, yeah, schism versus heresy. And then others are like, well, isn't schism heresy in, in the first place? Blah, 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 whatever. Um, so how do we claim to have unity? And how do we claim to be up, upholding unity if, if all of what I just narrated historically is true? And that's a great question. Well, let's, let's the, the question actually comes down to what, what, makes the church one? What makes the church unified? And that is actually what's going to help us answer the question of, of, of how we can claim to be unified. So if we look at scripture, if you look on, your, on the back of your solemn declaration, you'll find these biblical passages here. The, the two places that we're going to go to and that, that, we, that, that, that are most, most clearly, I think, talk about the unity of the church are John 17 and Ephesians 4. John 17 is what's called the high priestly prayer. It's where Jesus, right before his crucifixion in the Gospel of John, he, he has this very long prayer to the Father in the presence of his apostles. And he, he uh, even says a couple times, I'm praying this so that they hear it. So he's praying to the Father, but he's doing so in the presence of the apostles, and he's teaching them as he does so. So he says to the Father, Holy Father, keep through thine own name, 
those whom thou hast given me. Who are those whom he's given, who have given, who thou hast given him? Those are the apostles. He, in context, he's referring to these apostles. That they may be one, as we are. Who's the we there? Yeah. So, so he's, saying, he's asking that the apostles may be one, as he and the Father are one. And so the unity that he's asking for the apostles is, in fact, the internal unity of the Trinity, that you would be one as I and the Father are one. And one of the things I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to claim, there's some nuances that you'd have to make to it, is that what Jesus is doing is, is he is, when, when, when God, Jesus being God, when God, when we pray, we hope that it comes true, if that makes sense. When God prays, it comes true. When God says, let there be light, he doesn't then go, I hope there's light. It just is. And so what God says is. And so my, my, I think the best way to understand the, the, the prayer of John 17 is not as it's often interpreted like a hopeful prayer. Gosh, I hope they stay one. I hope that the church is unified. That'd be nice, wouldn't it? Instead, and it's not even like he's teaching them to stay one. He's actually making them one through his own prayer. He's declaring that they may be one as I and the Father are one. And so the unity of the church, I'm going to say, is actually bound up with the internal unity of the, of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost in the Trinity. And the reason we can say that, ultimately, is because the church is the mystical body of Christ. And so the church is actually Jesus Christ's mystical body. And so therefore, our union with each other is divine, ultimately, because it's, uni it's, it's unified in Christ. And then he goes on, this is skipping a few verses to, chap to verses 20 through 23. Neither pray I for these alone, these alone being the apostles, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. Who are those people? Those who will believe on me through their word. Yeah, you guys hear what Philip said? Us. We are the ones who believe in Christ through the word of the apostles, which most directly refers to, I think, the New Testament, which was written down by the apostles or, or the close associates of the apostles. And so we believe through the words of the apostles, if that makes sense. But also, I would say, through the apostolic teaching of the church, interpreting scripture authoritatively. That they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us. And so it's not just that these 11 apostles, Judas having exited out the side door, it's not just that these 11 apostles are, are unified by Christ's prayer, but rather the whole church, the whole church that hadn't yet come into existence, including us, we are in fact unified in the same way. That the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And so our unity is to be a sign for the world uh, of, of, the, in, in, of uh, Christ's true identity. And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. And so again, it's like, I, I just wanted to keep the whole quote because he says four times that the unity that the apostles have and then that we have is the unity of Jesus with the Father. And so those are, those are bound up together. The reason this matters is that if that's true, if the unity of the church is bound up in the Trinity, then the unity of the church is not something that we can actually do anything about one way or the other. Does that make sense? If, if the unity of the church is the internal unity of the Trinity, then it's actually unbreakable, and we can't break it. So then, of course, the question is, but we're not unified, so what does that mean? So we'll come back to that. And then we flip to Ephesians. Um, I, I, I preached on this passage a little while ago, so uh, I'm going to be plagiarizing myself here just a little bit. Paul says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. Live up to your vocation as Christians in love. And then this is the part that is significant for us, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. So we are striving to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. 
There's one body and one spirit, even as ye are called, and one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. I think one of the, one of the basic principles of, of St. Paul's letters, which I've said a number of times recently from the pulpit, um, is that what St. Paul commands us to do is always following from what he says about who we are. So he always says, he indicates who we are, and then he tells us, therefore, walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. Does that make sense? And so what I would say is that these calls to unity are ultimately a call to live up to the unity that already exists. So you are unified, therefore, live in unity. That's what I would claim is the best way to understand it. What you have here in this last sentence, there is one body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. There's seven ones in, um, in that sentence, and seven being this symbolic number of completion and perfection. He's trying to tell you something about the completeness of this unity. I think this is kind of like an early creed in a certain sense. It's a, it's a very compact early creed. One body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God. So he begins with one body, which is the church. There is one body. There's not multiple bodies. There's one body. There's one church. And so I would say there, you're either in the church or you're not. There's not multiple churches in an ultimate sense. Christian unity, as I said, flows from the unbroken internal unity of the Trinity itself, and so that makes sense. There's only one church, and you're either in it or you're not. And that unity is rooted in the Trinity here. It's threaded through. One Spirit, one God and Father, one Lord, Lord being a reference to Jesus. And so the, the one Holy Spirit, one Lord Jesus Christ, one God and Father of all. So the Trinity is, is woven in it. It's trin there's Trinitarian unity, just like in John 17. And there's one baptism. So baptism, we're going to say, is the thing that grafts us into Christ and makes us partake of the divine nature. It brings us into the church. It's the sacrament of unity. And baptism is a sacrament of the whole church. There's not an Anglican baptism or a Roman Catholic baptism or an Eastern Orthodox baptism or a Baptist baptism. And so any ba you're either baptized or you're not. And any Trinitarian baptism done with water, is considered, generally speaking, valid. If a non-Christian performed it, we would, we would conditionally baptize someone. But the basic, the, the church teaches that any Christian can baptize. Yeah, and we actually have, we have an emergency baptism form, and then there's a form for um, recognizing that baptism in the church. So, yeah, anybody can baptize. The, the priest or, priests or deacon, it's, it's, normally regularly reserved for priests and deacons to do so you'll never see in a normal baptism you never will see a lay person baptized not because they can't but because the presence of, of someone who's ordained is a recognition and the reason the other reason that you will very rarely will somebody be baptized outside of the church itself is because you are recognizing you are bringing someone into the church you're not just bringing them into a in, into a private relation with jesus christ but a relation with his body, the church. And so you have the ordained ministers of the church who are there affirming that this person is being brought into the church. And, and that's why everybody stands in ours and they turn um, and they are there welcoming this new Christian into the, into the body of Christ. Yep. So the, one of the points about baptism though is that, and, and this is true, Roman Catholics also, Eastern Orth well, Eastern Orthodox mostly, depends, generally recognize the baptisms of all Christians as long as they're done with, in the name of the Trinity with water. Does that make sense? So if you, if you, you know, were to end up in the Roman Catholic Church, they would not rebaptize you because they would recognize Anglican baptisms as valid. And so what, what I would say that that tells us is that we share a base level unity with all Christians. All Christians who've been baptized have been baptized into the same body of Christ. And so you would say all baptized Christians are in some sense Christians. And so we're all part of the same church. So there's one church, I said, not multiple churches. And yet somehow, mystically, all the, everyone who's been baptized at any point in time has been grafted into that same church. And so we share a base level unity with the sort of Fellowship Bible Church, the people at the Fellowship Bible Church down the road, 
with the Roman Catholics up the road, with the Eastern Orthodox, I don't know where they are, with the uh, Presbyterians, etc. There's a basic unity that we all share because we have the same baptism. We'll talk about limitations in that unity. We already have a little bit. We'll talk more in just a little bit. Now, how does, does that mean that everybody who's baptized is like, uh, got a straight ticket to heaven. The Roman Catholic Church doesn't teach that. We don't teach that. But we do say they've been grafted into Christ, and then we leave it up to God to sort out what that means for their sort of eternal state. But you don't, no matter how far you stray, you, 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 you're baptized as a kid. So, for instance, we at my old church, uh, uh, um, we had a kid confirmed who was baptized when he was an infant by his grandparents, but his parents, like his, par- his grandparents brought him to the church to have him baptized but his parents didn't bring him to the church and he never attended church in his entire life outside of that one little service when he was a little infant until he was 19 or 20 in college and then eventually sort of comes to to faith in Christ. Well, we didn't baptize him again. We confirmed him, but we didn't baptize him because he was already baptized. Now, what did that mean for his current state of faith? We don't know, but the church has always taught you don't re-baptize. And if it was a valid baptism, it doesn't matter how far he strayed, you don't do it again. One, uh, he also in here has mentioned faith and hope, which are two of the three theological virtues. Love is not mentioned in the seven, but if you actually look at the first verses before that, love is the kind of, he's, at the end he says, forbearing with one another in love. But I think the picture here and the picture throughout St. Paul's writings is that love is the ground of, of, of all of these things because God is love. And so what I would say is that love is the sort of ground and presupposition of all these seven unities. So you have faith, hope, and, and love is implied as well. So what I would say there, too, is that our, our, our unity is also rooted in some sense in the theological virtues, the three theological virtues of faith, hope, and love. So living out our calling is part of our unity, if that makes sense. Ultimately, what I want you to see from these two passages John 17 and Ephesians 4, is that the unity that we're talking about is not something we strive for or accomplish through grit and determination. It already exists. It's something that God did. It's an accomplished fact. But then, as we said, the church does not appear very unified. The prayer we started with, the prayer for the church, says where it is divided, reunite it. And so it is, in fact, divided in our experience of it. But what I think we have to remember is that when we're striving to unify the church, what we're actually striving to do is make visible a unity that already exists. Does that make sense? In the same way that when you strive to to live a holy life, you aren't striving to achieve uh, right standing or righteousness before God. You're actually living out the truth of your baptism, which is that you've been grafted into Jesus Christ and regenerated, and now you have to live out experientially, live out in your day-to-day life what's already actually true in, in the deepest sense of you. And so in the same way, when we strive for unity with other Christians, we're not trying to create something. We're trying to make visible and apparent and, and tangibly real to us what already actually exists. I think that's really important and helpful to think about. The next question, though, so it's united, it's rooted in Jesus Christ and in the Trinity, our unity, but how is it actually communicated to, to us? What, another way of saying it is, what is the visible instrument of unity? What is the thing that actually unifies us in practice, other than just privately believing in Jesus together in our heads? Does that make sense? Yes, well, so yeah, the, it's going to be baptism. We're going to get there. One of the things that, so, so, so Roman Catholics, Eastern Orthodox, everybody recognizes that we're united in baptism, ultimately, but they would also add on to that, um, that the, the true visible unity in the church, in the Roman Catholic Church, would be being in communion with the Bishop of Rome, the Pope. So the Pope is the instrument of unity, if that makes sense. How is the church unified? Well, everybody agrees baptism, yes, but there also has to be, you know, every, they're like, yeah, all baptized Christians are sort of part of the church, but they would say that the visible church are those who are under the Pope, if that makes sense. The Eastern Orthodox would see it be, as being in communion with the Eastern patriarchs. The problem with that, at least from an Anglican perspective, is that the, tr- the church is a body, it's an organism, and it's a sacramental organism, we'd say, that it's fundamentally sacramental. The sacraments are sort of at the heart of what the church is and what the church does, and neither the papacy nor the patriarchs are actually sacramental offices. So East and West, we hold the seven sacraments, and the Pope is not one of the sacraments. Becoming Pope is not a sacrament. You Becoming a bishop is a sacrament, 
but then the Pope is elected and, and, then, and, then, and then, I forget what the language is, he's installed as the, as the Pope, but it's not considered a sacrament. Making a person a Pope is not one of the seven sacraments. And so that's kind of interesting to me, that, that the instrument of unity in the West is not actually a sacrament. Does that make sense? And same with the East, actually. At least the East is less, I, don't, I understand the East less, and they're also less uniform. But it seems like for a lot of folks in the East, being united to one of the ecumenical patriarchs, one of the patriarchs, excuse me, makes you, one of the historic patriarchs makes you part of the visible church. But becoming a patriarch is not a sacrament either. So E.L. Mascal, the a great Anglican theologian of the last hundred years, he said the instrument of unity in a sacramental organism has to be a sacrament. It can't be, it can't be non-sacramental because that's not fundamental to who, who, the, chur- who the church is. The sacraments are fundamental. Uh, we would say, just as you guys all said, baptism is the fundamental sacrament of unity insofar as it grafts us into the church. That's what gets you in, but, we, but the Eucharist is also the sacrament of unity in that it's the thing that, that Tie, that, that, that fosters your unity as well. So one of the ways you, that you can think about this is that the church is, or the, the, the kingdom of heaven is often depicted in Christ's teachings as a wedding feast or a banquet where everyone is unified in this celebration. And the Eucharistic feast is a symbol and a sign and a foreshadowing of that. The Eucharist itself, itself is also the body of Christ. And so we feed on Christ's body and are therefore grafted. We, we feed on Christ's body sacramentally in the Eucharist and we're therefore sort of united mystically in the church. So the Eucharist is a sacrament of unity. But the, the Eucharist, Catholic Christians would teach, has to be celebrated at the hands of validly ordained priests, and so holy orders is also a sacrament of unity. And most fundamentally, the bishops, we would say, are, uh, provide the, the, the episcopacy is the, is the instrument of unity in the church because when, when Christ unified his church, it was those first 11 apostles. And so it's, apost- and, then, and then when you, the reason why confirmation is only done by bishops is because that's what we see in the New Testament. The passages we tend to associate with confirmation are ones where the apostles lay hands on, on Christians. And so apostolic hands are associated with, with unity in the church. And this argument that it's, it's apostolic succession, that is the order of succession of, of the apostles in the church, is I think implicit in the New Testament and it's explicit within a hundred years of the, 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 the close of the New Testament. They're already saying the, the bishop is the symbol of unity for the church. And, and so the church said that from at the latest, the early third century through to today said that the bishop is in fact the kind of instrument of unity. So there's the unity. I said this, this was supposed to be the church and authority. <laughs> uh, we don't really have time to get too much into the authority of the church, but I, I do think it's, it's worthwhile noting that, I think we would note just a couple things real quick. We'll go through this really fast. That in, the, in Jesus, we see a inversion of authority, but not its undoing. So, so Jesus says the last shall be first and the first shall be last. That inverts order, but it actually doesn't create disorder. There's still a first and a last. They're just redefined. And it's not just that they're reversed such that the oppressor becomes the oppressed and the oppressed becomes the oppressor. It's that first and last become redefined. And so the person who's first in the kingdom of heaven is the servant of all. Does that make sense? So you still have order. You still have hierarchy, but the hierarchy rather where in the world, the person at the top makes everybody else serve him, right? That's the that is the picture of order and power in the world. In the New Testament, in the church, being at the top means that you serve those below you. And so, uh, you know, one of the titles for the, that the Pope uses, which uh, in, other tra- in our tradition bishops use, is that the Pope is the servant of the servants of God. And so the idea, at least, is that, that the papacy is, exists to serve Christ- Christians. And we would say that's true for, for bishops as well. Of course, the church has failed to live that out as well as it should um, and always will. But authority in the church is in service um, of others. But uh, it's not a humility lacking in power. So when Jesus washes his disciples' feet, he is humbling himself and serving them, but he does not thereby empty himself of power and authority. Does that make sense? 
we, we have such trouble today. It used to be that, that we had trouble with the understanding the humble side of the, the service side of, of Christian leadership. Today, we, we are so uncomfortable in the modern world in a lot of cases with the exercise of authority altogether that we want to reject authority altogether. Does that make sense? When Jesus washes his disciples' feet, in no way does he therefore like lose his authority or power. Rather, what it is, is it's an authority that is characterized by humility. And so his authority is expressed in his humility, but it's not undercut. Mascal, same guy, has this great line about how when, when Christ stands before Pilate, it is Pilate and not Christ who is judged. Christ is the judge, not the one who is judged, even though Pilate thinks he's judging him. And when Christ, uh, and when Christ is on the cross, he is reigning from the tree. I just love that line. He's the king of the universe on the cross. And what the world sees as a lack of power and as a failure in, in the eyes of heaven is in fact um, great authority and power. So where does this, this show up? It shows up in the sacramental authority of excommunication. Paul says at one point in Philemon in particular, he asks Philemon to do something. We don't have time to get into the details, but he also says that he's confident of Philemon's obedience which is kind of a weird thing to say about a request. You know what I mean? Like, hey, I, I'm asking you, would you be willing to do this thing? I'm sure you'll obey. You're not asking if you've asked for their obedience. And he also goes on to say that he says, um, I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required. But then he says, I don't want to do that. I want you to do it willingly. But, if you don't, but the implicit is, if you don't do it willingly, I'm going to make you. <laughs> it's kind of funny. So St. Paul seems to assume that he has the power not just to persuade or to request something of Philemon, but actually to compel him to do it. Isn't that interesting? Obviously, it's not physical compulsion. St. Paul wasn't going to send legions of Roman soldiers to, you know, he didn't have any soldiers to, to compel Philemon. So how, did, how would he exercise the authority? Well, in 1 Corinthians, he describes how you exercise this authority. So 1 Corinthians 5.13, drive out the wicked person from among you. This is the power of excommunication. Uh, Jesus describes it also in Matthew 19. Excommunication means, if, if going into communion means, yes, come to the table together, being excommunicated means don't come to the table, you can't. And so the power of the church is in keeping with what it is, which is a sacramental organism. The, the, the instrument of unity are those sacraments I mentioned. The instrument of authority is also the sacrament. So you are withholding the sacrament. That's the true power of the church. It's not brute physical compulsion, but if you understand what the sacrament is, it's more powerful, more scary than anything that the state can do to you. And then uh, you see the same thing in the binding and loosing, which Christ gives to his apostles. What you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whose sins you remit, they are remitted. Whose sins you retain, they are retained. That's in Matthew 16, 16 and Matthew 18, 19. That um, is the power of Fundamentally, it's the power of confession, which is not just a power over sin. Some people say, oh yes, well, he gives the apostles the power to remit sins. It's really a power over the sinner. That's fundamentally what it is, because the, the, the priest in his position as confessor is either declaring that God forgives the person or saying God actually hasn't forgiven you. It's not for manipulation, obviously. People theoretically could use it for manipulation, and in the Middle Ages, that was done. Rather, it's to compel the person to repentance. The, the priest's only job is to, declare whether, is to declare whether the person essentially has repented or not. That's, why, when, whether, that's the question of forgiveness, to be clear. Whether, whether God forgives you or not is a question of whether you've repented. God offers forgiveness, but if you haven't repented, then you aren't receiving that forgiveness. The priest's job in the confessional booth is to ascertain whether you've actually repented of your sin. So if, if you come in and you're like, yeah, I shot a guy last week, boy, I guess I feel bad about that maybe. The confessor would probably be like, do you feel bad about it? And the person's like, not really. I mean, I'd do it again. But then you would say, well, okay, uh, you're not absolved because you haven't repented, right? Do you, do you see the, and so the job of the confessor is to, is to determine whether the person in front of them is actually repentant or not. But the withholding is a power, it really is a, it is a power over sinners to compel them to repentance. That's the purpose of it. And again, it's rooted in a, in a sacrament confession.
You can also look uh, in, in it, that, that it goes, it, it is fundamentally sacramental, but because the sacraments are at the core of our life, it, it appears to bleed over into all parts of life. And so just after St. Paul in 1 Corinthians 5 says, expel the wicked man from among you, in 1 Corinthians 6, he blames them for taking their lawsuits to civil courts, to secular courts, instead of taking them to the church to be arbitrated by the church, which is like, I mean, that sounds pretty crazy to me. Like, I was going to sue my neighbor, but instead I'm going to go ask Father Ralph what I should do about it. That sounds crazy, right? <laughs> but that seems to be what St. Paul assumes. And then he says, know ye not that we shall judge angels, how much more the things that pertain to this life. And to the extent that we cannot imagine the church doing that is an extent to which we can know that the church has failed to do its job, um, that you can't imagine asking Bishop Chad to resolve your property dispute suggests that. And there's actually one of the cool things is when you look at some of the fourth and fifth century bishops, they're complaining about how much time they're spending dealing with like trivial property disputes or somebody being angry about their neighbor's dog. It's just like, ah, oh, you know, I'd like to write my sermon, but they just can't get along. And so I'm stuck, you know, arbitrating. And that wasn't always necessarily healthy, but, but there is a sense in St. Paul that, that this church, this is your fundamental community. And if if there is a, a, an authority in, in, in eternity, then we need to figure it out what that looks like today. Last thing to say, if you know anything about the history of the church or just the church today, you're looking at what I've said there, and, and, and you should just be thinking about all the terrible priests and bishops who exist and how unbelievable it is that, this, that, that, that I'm suggesting that we actually invest <laughs> bishops and priests with authority. So, you know, but the potential for abuse is inherent in authority. That's, that's part of the deal. You can put up guardrails, and you should, and you should be careful about who you ordain, and you should, and, and one of the problems is churches in the last, probably forever, but certainly in the last 50 and 60 years have been not nearly careful enough about who they ordain and who they make into a bishop. What we're not permitted to do, I don't think, is to say, well, that since we've screwed up this authority thing so much, we're just not going to do it anymore. We're just, we don't, we're not going to have the authority. That's not possible, because it's, it's the authority of the church that Christ gave to the church. And it is too great for us, and so we have to exercise it in prayer um, and ask God's grace as we do that. Um, and then, and then, and it's precisely because there is this power and authority in the church that we all have to exercise Christ-like humility. So in Luke 22, Saint Paul he, or Saint Paul, uh, Jesus is arbitrating a dispute among his apostles. This is the last last paragraph here, and and there it's it's when. Um, John and, oh man, I'm forgetting, two of the apostles were, wanted seats on his right and his left, and they're, they're squabbling over, and everybody's getting mad, like, how dare you try to, I'm, I'm more, you know, they're fighting over position. And Jesus says, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and they that exercise authority upon them are called benefactors, but ye shall not be so. But he that is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he that is chief as he that doth serve. For whether is, whether is greater, he that sitteth at meat or he that serveth is not he that sitteth at meat, but I am among you as he that serveth. He's just washed their feet sort of in this context. And so he's saying, who's the greatest person in this room? It's me. And what did I do? I served you. And so if you would like to be great, then you must serve, right? The, the point is, is, is fundamentally there's a moral and ethical point that, it, that, that you are to serve other people but he actually connects it to eternity. He says, I appoint unto you a kingdom as my father hath appointed unto me. He's saying to these dumb apostles, and they're just dumb throughout the gospels, I'm giving you a kingdom that ye may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. They're going to sit on thrones in eternity, these 11 dumb apostles, uh, and eventually the 12th Matthias. And so the reason, this is, this is what we sort of miss out. We like the humility part a lot of times, but the reason for the humility is because you're going to be invested with authority. And so if you're going to exercise authority, then you need humility. What's important, I think, for us is that, is that again, when we look at the, what are the fundamental expectations for those who are going to exercise authority in the church is that humility is supposed to be at the center of that. And we've put all sorts of other things like um, charisma and, and, and wit and whatever um, as the kind of reasons for choosing somebody. And so... I think if we look at the New Testament, if, there's, if, if you see a person without humility, that person should not be in church leadership. But church leadership attacks, attracts narcissists and egotists. Ego 
And so it's, we have to be you know, more careful than we are. I should have a better way to wrap this up, but this is all. <laughs> but I'm just going to end in a minute, basically finish the sentence and end. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Father, thank you for your church. I pray that you would help us to be stewards of the gifts of your church, that you would guide those who are in authority over us, that you would help us to serve them humbly, but also to hold them accountable to be the leaders you call them to be. And I pray that you would give those in leadership over us wisdom and humility and courage to do what is right and to protect and steward the church as under shepherds under the great shepherd. We ask all these things in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen.